Okay. Um, I can. Okay, um, good. So um, if you recall last time we talked about um, linear subspaces, bases, um, and like the bases for linear subspaces and the dimension of a subspace. And for that, we um, basically relied on this notion of linear independence and the notion of the span. Okay, so a linearly independent set of vectors that spans a subspace is a basis for that subspace and the number of elements of a basis is the dimension, right? Okay, so, the next idea was, so this is basically a summary of this slide. This is a summary of uh, the things that we sort of discussed. Um, the linear subspaces are one ingredient or one interesting object in linear algebra. Um, the second interesting um, collection of objects is the set of linear operators or linear maps or linear functions. And these are functions that map between two linear spaces. So for us, usually linear space is, is this Rn or like Rm. So Euclidean space, you can think of these as vectors with uh, like a scalar coordinates. So this, this is a vector um, with, with n coordinates, right? So x1, x2 up to xn. Um, but, but all the things that we talked about sort of generalize to abstract uh, linear spaces. So a function that maps from these um, between two linear spaces is a linear map if it satisfies um, these properties that when you apply it to a linear combination or to apply it to a summation, it just um, passes through the summation, basically. Um, it's, it's linearly applied, basically. And then uh, if you apply it to a scalar multiplication, it also passes through. Uh, and so this means that if you apply it to a linear combination, it passes through the linear combination in the natural way. So you get, um, so starting from a linear combination of the elements in the input space in Rn, uh, when you apply F to it, um, you're effectively forming the linear combination of these F of Xi's, which are the values of the function at um, these basic input vectors. So you can imagine that if um, the Xi's, let's say X1 up to Xn, form a basis of the original input space or, or whatever subspace this is defined. So it could be defined in a different subspace of Rn and maps to a, like a smaller subspace of Rm. So if x1 up to xn form a basis for, for this V, um, we can write anything in V as a linear combination of these xi's. And I can evaluate, I can find, find out what the function does to that vector um, by just knowing what it does to the elements of the basis. Okay, so that's another place where the bases come in. So if you have a linear map, and if you have a basis for the subspace, you just need to know what F does to the elements of the basis. Uh, once you know that, you can you know like everything about the linear transformation. You know what it does over the whole the space or like the subspace V. So is that good? Questions, comments? So that it's rather quick, but I'm I'm hoping that you've seen some of it in hopefully like most of it in, in, in linear algebra course, okay? Um, so if you like take it one step further, you can just arrange these Fxi's into a matrix. So if I have, um, you think of the, the, this matrix as um, a matrix uh, whose columns are these Fx1, Fx2 up to Fxn. So these are um, n-dimensional vectors. And I have, um, sorry, m-dimensional vectors because I'm assuming that f maps to Rm. 
So f of x1 is m-dimensional, f of x2 is m-dimensional, and so on. And I have n of them because I'm assuming that, let's say, v is n-dimensional. Um, and so I, I put them as the columns. Um, so this defines a matrix. So it would be like an m by n matrix. Then it's easy to verify that if I multiply a by um, c1 up to cn, um, that would form this linear combination. So this is what I want to basically um, talk a little bit about. So let's call this maybe x to be somewhat um, more um, in line with um, what I have in the next slide. So um, once you think of this, um, this operation is basically defining the linear transformation, so or the, the linear map. So when you compute f, um, you can think of f basically, um, you don't need to keep track of x's anymore, sort of, you're just applying it to these. Um, so this operation, matrix operation to these coefficients. And um, so basically what, what F does, so basically, okay, F of, uh, I should we call it. Um, so if I think of the, um, yeah, so let's call this V. So F of V is basically going to be X times uh, the C, okay? And um, so for every vector V, it has a representation in, in the basis. Representation means a lead can be written as a linear combination with some coefficients. So let's call those coefficients the representation of V. So these, this is the representation of V. I just take the representation of V as a vector, um, multiply X on the left, so X times that, and this gives me the value of the function. So you can think of the linear maps as basically these matrices effectively. So this linear map is like, um, just represented by this matrix in that basis, okay? Um, so this motivates the study of matrices, and it's always good to think of matrices as linear operators. Basically, they're doing some sort of a transformation. From um, the input domain, which is in this case would be, for example, Rn, to the output domain, which is going to be Rn. So if you have an m by n matrix, you can think of it as a sort of a linear operator from Rn to Rn, okay? And um, that's basically what I want to sort of talk a little bit about, okay? Questions? So the notation that I have in this slide is slightly different, but basically follows the same thing. So suppose I have, um, now let's say I have x1 up to xp, we don't have to have like n, uh, vectors, we can have like a smaller number than the dimension of the space. So x1 up to xp in Rn, I form a matrix which, which looks like this. So it's going to be n by p. And um, then I form x beta. So the coefficients I'm now writing is beta, beta 1 up to beta p. Um, and this operation um, produces these general linear combinations, as, as I mentioned above. Uh, this might not be. So this is very much the same as this. I'm just renaming C to be betas, and I'm keeping like P elements here. So let's say I have a um, um, set of vectors that are P-dimensional. Sorry, sorry, a set of vectors um, with P um, elements. So this operation, that when you multiply a matrix by a vector, you get a linear combination of the columns. It's very useful. Okay, so this might not be obvious to people um, because of the way that you usually see matrix multiplication. Okay, so let me ask you how you, for example, multiply a matrix by a vector. So suppose I give you this matrix X, right? So this is, let's say, um, suppose this is, um, in our case, it's going to be uh, N by P. So let's say N is bigger than P. So N, let's say, is 10, P is 5. Uh, so that's my X. And then I have um, a vector beta, which is uh, going to be P by 1. So that's, that's beta. So how do you 
do this matrix multiplication. Let's see, people. Yeah. Take the first row and multiply it by the whole column, and then that goes in like the first entry of your unit. Okay, great. So. N by one. Yes. Okay. Good. So, so the first row gets multiplied point by so the first element here gets multiplied by the first element there plus the second element gets multiplied by the second element and then you add them up you get a number so that goes there and then you have the second row um gets multiplied by the same thing in the same way and then gives you the second element okay um you form basically um the point wise product of the elements and then you add them up and then you get this, and then it goes like because you have n rows there. So the inner dimensions, you recall that this inner dimensions should match, and here they match. And when you do the matrix multiplication, you get n by one basically. So the inner dimension sort of collapses. You get um, the last one here would be um, like this. Okay, so you get n by. Um, And n by one, like there, sort of like this, n by one. So that will be the result. Okay. Everyone remembers this way of doing it. That's that's how everyone remembers it. So is there a way that another way that I can multiply these two? Rather than working with the rows, let's say we work with the columns. Has anyone seen that kind of? So that's what, what I'm using here. So there's another way of doing it, which is often not the way that people think about this, um, but it's equivalent. So the same thing. have a matrix here, right? So n, n, p is equal to five. Um, beta is again, p by one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the elements, let's say they have five elements here. Um, let's say that it's four, I can do five. Let's say it's even three for simplicity. P is three, so I get, Say it's three. So this was like three elements, but um, so I have a P equal three equal. Um, so I have the beta here. I'm going to multiply them, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the first element of this multiply by the whole column here, plus the second element of this multiplied by this whole column, plus the third element here multiply by this whole column and then add them up. Okay, so you get like this little thing. So this is gonna be beta one, beta one, this is gonna be x one. So you get beta one, x one, this is a vector, plus uh, this is gonna be beta two, this is going to be x2, so you get plus beta 2 x2. And then this is going to be beta 3 x3, so you get plus beta 3 x3. Okay, so this would be equivalent. So it gives you the same result. So you can view matrix multiplication in this way. So um, either you do it row-wise or column-wise. When you do it column-wise, if this side is a vector, basically you're forming a linear combination of the columns of x with coefficients that are in beta. So this is a general way of forming a linear combination. And that, that's what I have here, what I was talking about. So if you multiply this matrix, which has these columns, by, um, by the betas, you're basically like forming the linear combination of these columns, um, right? So, so these, these are column vectors. Um, so let me do like beta one. It's just basically beta one, x one, up to beta p, x p. 
right, in each one of the columns. So in linear algebra, we care about like linear combinations, and this is a very general way of forming a linear combination. So if you want to form a linear combination or the set of linear combinations, a set of vectors, you put them as columns of a matrix, then you multiply it by a vector, it forms it like a linear combination of those with the coefficients that are in the vector. Okay, sounds good. Do this as an exercise for a, like a numerical example to convince yourself that it's the same thing. Uh, it requires a little bit of proof, but uh, I'll leave it to you to figure it out. So now I can look at the span of these vectors. So the span of the columns of um, matrix X and the span, if you recall, is, is, is this. So the set of all linear combinations of um, X1 up to XP. Um, so it's basically the set of all X beta is where beta is our, in our P. Um, so this is um, the usual definition that we had. And this would be in R. So these coefficients in R. Uh, I can compactly write this as, right, this is that, and, and this is equivalent to this X beta. Right. Um, so can equivalently write it like that. Uh, so the column space of X is defined as the span of X1 up to XP. That's, that's the thing that I'm trying to remind you here. So for a matrix, we have a column space, sometimes called an image, um, sometimes column span. It has other names. And this column space is just the span of the columns. And the span of the columns is basically the set of linear combinations of the columns, and this is the compact form of it. So it can be written, the span of the columns is X beta, beta in RP. So this thing is called the column span, okay? It's, um, so this is not something really new because you already know about the span. It's just a name that we attach. For every matrix, we have a column space, or uh, sometimes called this column space, sometimes called this span, sometimes, column span, sometimes uh, the image. And um, this, um, this is going to be useful for us. Okay, so this is one of the basic subspaces. So this is going to be a subspace because we have seen that the span of a bunch of vectors is always a subspace. So it's a linear subspace associated with the matrix or a linear operator. And this is one of the fundamental um, subspaces associated with the matrix um, as we um, um, interesting uses in, in, in linear algebra. Okay. Why it's called the image? Because you can think of these as, if you recall, that this is the value of f um, at some v. So these are um, the values of the function. These are the, in the image of the function. So this is the set of vectors that are in the image of the function. So all the vectors in R um, p here are mapped to things that look like x beta. And as beta varies, you cover everything that um, is in the image of the function. So when you write a function like this, for example, um, it's not necessary that you cover all of Rm. You cover a subspace of Rm, which is the column span of the corresponding matrix. Yes? Well, that example, the, the x matrix is the function, and then the beta vector is the vector you are Yes. Yeah, so this x is the representation of the function. And beta is the representation of the vector that you're applying to in the basis. So there is the, um, so think of the, so beta is not the, uh, yeah, let's see how we can uh, discuss it. Um, Yeah, the easiest way to think about is, is think about, yeah, so X is the function or the linear operator, beta is the vector that you're applying to. And, and then you apply to get X beta, yes. So the easiest thing, if you forget about the abstract version, so you think of this as, um, um, so one caveat here to mention, um, so let's say this XIs are, uh, I don't know if I want to mention this. It's going to be confusing. So if this X i is where the, or like the standard basis, is the, do you know about the standard basis of our N? So anyone? 
So let's say Rn um, here has um, yeah. Let, let's not let's not worry about that. I, I think I'm going to confuse you a lot um, if I. So this um, abstract view can be mapped to. So the thing is, um, if you have a function, you can pick any basis, and you get a representation. And the representation changes. The matrix changes. Um, so the same linear operator can have different matrices depending on what basis you use. So you can have different bases. And then uh, these coefficients would correspond to that basis. So these are the coefficients that describe the input vector in that basis. And so this is going to be um, uh, sort of the result. But, but in order to avoid confusion in this course, I'm not going to worry about the abstract setting. This is just our going to be our function. This is going to be our vector. So this applied to this vector. This is the input vector. This is going to be our function, like linear map, and then x beta is the output. OK, so this is the easiest way to think about. Um, I should probably have avoided talking about the abstract version. So you can think of x as a linear operator. Uh, it maps data to x beta. And um, the, um, the abstract thing you can work out, but um, I just wanted to give you some idea um, about the abstract idea. But, but for now, it's easiest to think of matrices as just linear operators. Forget about the representation in the basis. We have fixed the basis, let's say the standard basis. And now we have a single matrix. Every matrix corresponds to um, a linear operator. X on a vector gives you, and this is the output basis. Okay, input vector, output vector, and this is the linear map. Okay, and it's very easy to, to verify that this is a linear map because if I have, for example, um, beta one plus beta two, um, if I apply x to it, um, you know that by like the rules of matrix operation, it just um, fact like um, you can distribute the, the thing, and so you can see it's a linear operator. Matrix multiplication is the operator, so it satisfies those operations. So um, I think this is easiest to 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 work with. So I would think of matrices as linear operators acting on um, the vectors whose dimension is uh, basically their column dimension, and the output dimension is the row dimension. And so the column span or the the image would be the set of all possible vectors that you can get in the output. And so that, that's naturally called the image, we call this one. Okay, sounds good. The caveat is that there is an abstract version of this, um, which if you're interested, you can read about like in linear algebra courses, um, people think about these linear maps as abstract maps and then they have representation in terms of matrices once but once you set a basis um, everything is settled into a single matrix um, and, and and then things are fine okay sounds good okay so you know about know about hopefully knew about column space how many people actually knew about column space column space zero okay how many people know about the rank of the matrix? Okay, so you should know about the column space. So what is the rank of the matrix? Anyone? Uh, or maybe, yeah, someone from the front, maybe this time. Uh, okay, so you know what it is. So, so let's, let's keep that. Anyone else? Uh, what is the rank? Yes. Okay, this one I don't know, but yeah, so you're better than me. That's a number of the rank of rank of x is the number of pivots. Probably correct. Yeah, pivots in re reduced row echelon form. Yeah. So this is like the operational. Definition of the rank, how you can find it, you do the reduced row echelon form, which is a very nice form if you haven't seen it. Uh, you guys know this better than me, hopefully, because probably have worked this out in English algebra course, the number of pivots. 
this is fine. Um, but the, there's, there is a version that I um, am interested in, which, which has meaning, like more meaning related to this things that we talked about. So what, what is the other definition? It was already mentioned, but I just want to see if anyone else knows about that. This is good. Operational definition of the rank. It, it has to do with some sort of a dimension, notion of a dimension. Yes. Yes, okay, so that was the answer that was given as well. So basically, once you define the column space, this is a linear solid space and it would have a dimension. The dimension of this is called the rank of the matrix. Okay, so if you go back to the definition of the, de the dimension, it's the number of elements in the basis, or you can think of the, um, it as like the maximum number of these that you have to pick to be, um, linearly independent and still span the same thing okay so some of these uh, when you form this they might be linearly independent so the call if the columns are linearly independent because by definition they span the column span they form a basis and so the rank would be p so if, if the original columns are linearly independent um, the dimension of the column space would be p but if if the vectors are not linearly independent then um then the, the rank would be less than P because um, although they span what you care about, which is the column space by definition, uh, they're not linear independent. So you have to pick a set of linear independent vectors that span the same thing. And that set has to have smaller number of elements. Um, and so the rank would be smaller, okay? So for example, if you have, um, so let's, let's give an example. So let's say f x is one one zero one negative one zero. Okay. So what is the rank of this matrix? Two. Yes. Why? Yes. Yeah. So you have like you have to look at the columns. You, you look at the columns as a set of vectors. You have two vectors. This set of vectors is linear independent. We have already talked about this, and um, by definition, they span the column span, so they form a basis for the column span or the column space, and so the rank is two. Okay, um, and then if you have x is like one one zero two two zero, what is the rank of this guy? One, because the columns are linearly dependent, and I can pick one of them, and it just spans the whole thing, and so the rank here is going to be one. Okay, so uh, this summarizes these ideas. Column space, sometimes called range, sometimes called image, is the set of all uh, linear combinations of the columns, uh, or x beta as beta varies in P. Um, it's a linear subspace of Rn. Its dimension is called the rank of the matrix. And um, this statement is not quite correct. I have corrected um, the number of linear independent columns. You have to like, massage it a little bit, you understand what I mean. Um, okay. Um, there's also a row space, which is equivalently defined uh, in terms of the row. So the span of the rows, and the, then there's, sometimes it's called the column rank because it's the dimension of the column space. There's a row space, which is the span of the rows, and the rank of that is called the row rank, but there is a theorem in linear algebra that says that the row rank is equal to the column rank. So there's no need to dis distinguish that there is a single rank. Uh, but for us, we usually work with the column space, as you will see. If you have seen regression, x beta should remind you of linear regression. Um, so we're not going to worry too much about the rows, but you should know that it exists. Uh, another way of seeing it is that the row of space is the basically column space of another matrix. Anyone knows? So row of space of X can be written as the column space of, yes. Transpose yes, great, X transpose. So basically transpose, if you have a matrix, like 10 by five, let's say, this is X. Uh, so these are the rows 
the transpose basically will flip the matrix so the rows would become the columns. So, so this guy goes here, this guy would go there. So now I can talk about everything. So there's like this duality between rows and columns. So, so you don't need to worry about um, that. So basically what it's saying is like the dimension of the column space of X and the dimension of the column space of X transpose is the same. So that's the rank of the matrix that, that I haven't proved, but that's the result in the algebra. So the transpose helps you like translate between rows and columns. Sounds good. So this one, um, uh, so by the way, I mean, when you answer, tell, tell me your name so that I learn your name. So what was your name? Priyanka. Uh, so the, the answer to Priyanka, okay, check this. You guys are better than me at this, but this is like in practice how you can do it. Sometimes like things are easy. So you can just look at the columns. If, if I give you like a matrix, which is 10 by five, it's not easy to uh, like by eyeballing it, it's not easy to figure out. So you have to do some operations and this, these uh, reductions help the radius row echelon form helps. And in some of the homework problems, you probably do that to figure out the rank, but just know that, um, so these operations basically what they, show is like, um, I forgot if they, they might preserve the row space. Um, the way that you do it is probably do it on the rows. Um, so for, for example, if I add two rows, it doesn't change the row span because uh, it's easy to verify um, that. Um, um, so if I have, for example, so because I, I did everything for the column. So if I have like, if you look at the span of X1, X2, and X3, uh, for example, the span of this is the same as the span of, let's say this, um, right? If I add two of the vectors, uh, replace one by the summation of the two, this is not gonna change the span because um, from these, I can reconstruct the original one. Right? I can subtract x2 from this, I get that, and then I have the rest. And from this, I can construct that by linear operation. So the span has to be the same. Any linear combination of these can be written as a linear combination of these and, and back. Um, in, in reality, it's echelon form. You do it under rows instead of columns. But, but the basic idea is that I can add two rows, and that doesn't change the span. I can sub subtract two rows, doesn't change the span. I can multiply by a scalar. And so by doing that, you reduce it to a form that then you look at it, you can read out the rank. And it does it on the rows, but because the row rank is the same as the column rank, you're, you're going to be fine. Um, you can do the same on the columns, basically. Um, sounds good. So it's just um, review this for yourself. You're not going to use it that much, maybe in the early part of the course, but it's a very good thing to remember or know about. Um, so let's call this operational definition. It's not the definition, but it's just operational way of doing the rank, of figuring it out the rank. Questions? Um, what is the second most important um, sort of space associated with the matrix? It's called the kernel of the matrix. So let me uh, not show it. Ask you guys, kernel or null space? So how many people know about this? Yes. Oh, okay. You go for it. What was your name, by the way? Rishi. Rishi, okay. It has something to do with the zero vector. I don't remember if it's something that matches the zero vector or something that... Okay, it has to do... One of those. Good. It, it's good to remember it that it has to do with... with the zero vector. So null means sort of zero. So it's a good guess. So... You wanted to say something as well? Great. What's your name, by the way? Joseph. Joseph, Joseph. okay. Um, basically, what? Uh, so the set of vectors, let's call this the set of vectors that are mapped 
map to zero. So recall that the matrix is a mapping really. So, um, so if I want to look at the set of all vectors beta in the input space such that they're mapped to zero, I'm going to look at all the betas such that x beta is zero. Okay, so the um, so there is this um, let's say R P, um, and there's some part of the space here um, that's completely mapped to let's say the mapping is from R P to R two. Let's say here is R. Um, Say the, the the matrix is mapping from R um, three, let's say to R two. So this entire, for example, subspace space could be mapped to zero. So that that's that's the kernel, the, the linear transformation, or or the um, null space. Um, so the kernel is a subspace space of the input space. So X, remember X is, um, sometimes we write it as uh, N by P. So this is an N by P matrix. Um, so, it's, so when you have an N by P matrix, it's really a mapping. Sometimes I write it as, it's a mapping from RP to RM, RN. Remember the, um, so the number of columns is basically the dimension of the input space and the number of rows is dimension of the output space. So it really maps from RP to RN. So the image would be a subspace space of RN because it's a set of all vectors that you can get as the, as X beta. The kernel is in, in the input space. It's subspace space of RP because it's a set of all vectors that map to zero. Okay, so kernel lives here. Uh, so kernel of X is a subspace of this image of X is a subspace of that. Okay. So the image tells you basically if I map the whole space here, um, it might map to something like that here. Okay. So that would be the image. And this would be the kernel. This thing would be the kernel. The kernel is in this side, on this side, image is on the other side. Yes. Um, second bullet point, what is the symbol You mean this? Yeah. Uh, that's the symbol for a subset. So subset, and there's some people put it like a, so this is that, and then sometimes put, put, put it something here, which could be equal. Like subset or equal. Sometimes I drop that, but I just mean the same thing. Right? Is that clear the notation? Yeah. Okay. So kernel of X is also a linear subspace. In order to verify that, you have to verify it's close under addition and scalar multiplication. And then it's easy to verify that. So I like to verify that. So both image and kernel are linear subspaces. And they're both associated with the matrix. And there is an interesting sort of interplay between these two. So kernel is somehow um, um, like the, the singular part of the map. So everything that maps to zero, basically you lose that part of the information. Um, it, it tells you something about how much information the map is losing or destroying. Um, so a map that doesn't lose information, its kernel would be just a zero here. So, so if the kernel is like, um, so the, usually the ideal thing is the kernel is just the trivial subspace. The trivial subspace has to have um, zero in it for it to be linear subspace, but, but nothing else. So only the zero is mapped to zero. These are like maps that don't sort of destroy information. But if if your kernel is non-trivial, so there's like a really genuine, like a genuine subspace that entirely mapped to zero, so you lose that information. So from the output, you can't tell any of those vectors from each other. So all of them are the same as, uh, if, when, when you look at the output domain, all of them are zero, basically. So there's no way to recover them. So this has some notion of loss of information built into it. So, so measures. Um, 
information loss, let's say. It's like a, not a precise definition, but just intuitively. Um, the amount. Or information loss by the math. Okay. So let's let's try this. Questions? Let's see. So x one one zero two two zero. We already know that the dimension of the image of this is one, so the rank is one. How about the kernel? So can we can we figure out the kernel of x? I need to like figure out the kernel. Can write a set of equations from the definition and try to solve that. Maybe think a little bit about this. See if anyone can tell me what the kernel of this math is. Write down these equations. So you want all the betas that satisfy x beta equal to zero. So that gives you a linear system of equations. You solve for beta. You can also talk to like the mini. Maybe like 30 seconds, talk to your friends, think together what the kernel is. Someone tell me after that. Okay, any volunteers? You need more time to think about it. Can you walk me through what I should do? Yes. So, uh, oh, I'm Darian. Darian, okay. So, uh, I did like, so we're trying to like solve like the set of vectors, right? For a set of vectors, I'm yeah. Apply, like, to x. I'm going to apply x to a set of vectors. So, like x1, x2, right? Or like x1, x2, x3. Because that has to have like three components, or else like vector multiplication will be like legal. So, uh, you want to x. Uh, so, tell me what you want to do. Like, apply x to x1, up like this. One one zero two two zero. Oh, but like for the second mission, I like rotate that. Like the transfer of that. So like x one x two x three could be like linear, or like sorry, like horizontal. Sorry. Yeah. On this side or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, and then I set that equal to zero, and then I create a little like system of equations. But this is not a valid matrix multiplication, is it? Probably not. Not. So if you put it on the other side, <laughs> oh. this is, yeah, so this is like three by two, right? This is going to be one by three so that you can multiply them. If you put it on the other side, it would work, but that wouldn't give you, um, would I give you the image? Yeah. I also looked at my work and I don't think I did this right. Really? So, yeah, we're good. We're good. Very good. Okay. <laughs> that is good. Like uh, points for attempt and courage, too. So, anyone else did try it? It's on the right track. You just have to figure out if you, if you want to, like, you have to form this x beta, 
just have to figure out how to write this, All right? So this is three by two. So I want to multiply by beta here. So what is the dimension of the beta? Two, two by one. So that's that's the first thing to know. So it's going to be beta one, beta two. So I'm going to do this, then I can multiply. So this is going to be zero. The zero would be how many dimensions? So this zero is not a single number. It's a vector. Yes, three by one. Yes. Yeah. So, so once you figure this out, then this is the equation. So you want to find all the betas that satisfy this. Multiply, you get beta one plus two beta two equal to zero. Beta one plus two beta two equal to zero, and then zero equal to zero. Basically, the second, the last equation is vacuous. Right, zero times beta one plus zero times beta two is equal to zero. So that doesn't give you anything. If you want zero times beta one plus zero times beta two is equal to zero. So we can drop this. Um, so I get the system of linear equations, but one of the equations is like not needed. I'm going to drop this. They're the same. So what I end up is basically one equation. So can we solve this? Yes. Any value such that beta two is negative and half of beta one. Yes. Okay. Good. At this point, there's there a couple options. We can just stop and say the the kernel is just that all vectors beta one, beta two, such that they satisfy this equation. Okay. Um, that's one option. But uh, what Rishi said was better. So not better, but alternative. So the set of all beta one and beta two, such that beta one is plus beta. So this cannot be really solved. That there. There's no single solution to it. Uh, there are a lot of solutions. That's one version. The other version is what uh, we actually mentioned. Uh, this is all vectors. Can you say that again? That beta two is half and beta one and it's negative. So beta two is, for example, you can solve for one in terms of the other. Beta two is half of negative half of negative one half of beta one. Okay. So then I can write it as beta one minus one half. Beta one minus one half beta one and then zero. And then beta one can be anything. Right. And if I just factor this beta one out, you can see like one minus one half zero. Um, beta one is in R. Um, so that's the. Is there another way of writing this? Like more compact? Yes. So why does the first part of the order only a two dimension? The second time there's a zero. You're right. I'm, I'm wrong here. Great. This is the correct one. Uh, beta one minus one half beta one. It should be two dimensional. Another way of writing it. Beta one. One minus one half. Using span. Span of one minus one half. Does that work? Works. That's the definition of the span. So these are all the different representation of the kernel. So you can say this is all vectors that satisfy this linear equation or the span of, this is like constructive. This is like implicit. So these, these representations are sort of dual to each other. But this representation, if you write it like that, it's clear what the dimension of the kernel is. What is the dimension of the kernel? One, I see one, yes. It's not two because the span of one vector can at most be like, it's just a line. Um, so in, in the span would be in R2. There's just going to be like a line which is in the direction of one and minus one half. Um, so it'll be this line.
So the dimension of the kernel is sometimes called nullity of the map. So the nullity is one. Another way of seeing it is I have two free parameters in the input the space. I have one linear constraint, sort of linear, linear constraint which is independent. So these are dependent linear constraints. The two of them, they're the redundant. This is one linear constraint, which is non-redundant, basically. So one constraint removes one degree of freedom. So you have two degrees of freedom. One linear constraint removes one. So you get one remaining, which is the dimension of this. So that's like a heuristic argument. Removes one, like the equation, number of equations, basically, each time you have a set of uh, equations, if these equations are sort of linearly independent, um, they remove from the dimension of the input the space, you get the dimension of the kernel. So we, we had two um, set of equations here that were linearly independent, it would force the solution to be zero. So I would remove two degrees of freedom and then the span would be just the span of zero. Because the, here, like you can see that the rows are the same, they don't contribute the same they, they contribute the same set of equations or the same equation. So uh, the kernel here becomes non-trivial. If this was, for example, one tree, the second equation would force, together with the first equation, would force the solution to be zero, zero. And so you get a trivial kernel. Anyways, so this is how you do the kernel, yeah. Is it possible for the two equations to then just like come up with one solution, like two comma two, and then have that be the kernel? No. So the, when, when it's like a single solution has to be zero, um, it would be a homogeneous system of equations. So you would get like, um, because x beta is equal to zero, right? When you solve it, if it's just, there is a single solution that has to be zero, right? It can't be like, if it's like this, the single solution is like one minus one, that that's not a linear solid space. So, the only singleton set that's a linear subspace space is just this, uh, the singleton set that contains zero. No other singleton set is a linear subspace. space. You can verify that. Um, easy to verify because if I scale it, if I scale zero, I start in the same space. But if I scale something in the non-zero vector, I'm gonna get, get outside that space, yes. So for kernel zero, the vectors are linearly independent. Um, that it, it's a little bit more tricky. So you mean kernel of x is this here, right? Um, the kernel is the set of the singleton set containing zero, then. You say you want to say that, but what what is linearly independent? Uh, um, that you have to do it by a bit of argument. So this tells you something about the rows. Basically, it's just um, it's it's hard to say. Um, You can you can say the columns are linearly independent. That's true, but you have to use a result that relates the the dimension of the kernel to the dimension of the image, because the number of so if if you say the columns of X are linearly independent, you basically are saying that the um, column space of X has the maximum rank that it can have. Uh, so the rank would be two. So you have to connect the rank to the nullity, basically. Okay, um, and that's exactly what what we can do. Uh, but uh, so that so here, for example, you can see that the uh, so there's this thing. So the rank of x plus the nullity of x is going to add up to the dimension of um, the dimension of the input space. So if if this is zero, the rank has to be two, and so you'd have um, two linearly independent um, columns. If it's, this is one like here, then the rank has to be one and you already knew that. So, so you have calculated the rank from this rank nullity 
here, right, plus nullity is equal to, this would be um, if the map is a mapping from R P to R N, so this would be P. So you can use this result, but there's a bit of argument. It's not that obvious. Good point. Any other? So this result, um, I haven't proven it. I'll talk a little bit about this. So this follows from something that we talk about later, just a few slides down. Um, but there is there's an interplay between the kernel of X um, and actually the image of X transpose, or the image of X and the kernel of X transpose. Because um, remember, the image and the kernel are not in the same space. But if I transpose one of them, so the kernel of X transpose lives in the same space as the image of X, image of X transpose lives in the same space as the kernel of, I forgot what I said, image of X transpose lives in the same space as the kernel of X and vice versa. Okay, so if you want to compare the image to the kernel, you have to, to do image of one compared to the kernel of the transpose of it, right? So you can't compare directly the image of a matrix to its kernel, but you can compare the image of a matrix to the kernel of its transpose, or you can compare the image of X transpose to the the kernel of x and then so on. Sounds good. How many people have seen this rank nullity? Yeah. Okay, a couple of people have seen. Because we have looked at this and said the rank is one, we could have said that easily that the nullity has to be one. So that that that's one way to verify, right? Okay. Questions? Done with this. The next thing is no questions. The next set of ideas is ideas around inner product or commonality and projection, which is very important to us. Um, so, many people have seen inner products? Okay, what is an inner product? A few people have seen it. I actually have written it down here. So it's just to every um, pair of vectors, we can associate a scalar, right? Inner product is a scalar, num like a, a scalar product is a form of product. It's basically the summation of the products of the elements. Or if you view the vectors as um, column vectors, this would be X transpose. This would be Y. It just can be written as this matrix multiplication, X transpose matrix multiplied by y. So it's one by n times n by one. So the dimensions sort of work out and the inner dimension collapses so you get x transpose y. So this notation I'm gonna use uh, often and this also is gonna be used. This has more, more meaning than this. So this is by definition, this is just reduces the idea to the matrix multiplication. So why this is important because this gives you uh, um, the idea of being orthogonal. So if this inner product between two vectors is zero, um, then X is orthogonal to Y, the usual geometric notion, yes. What are the same thing as dot product? Dot product, yes. So another name is dot product. Um, there's another thing is called outer product, which is like a matrix in this case. But inner product, dot product, they're the same thing. Scalar product, if you want. That's what we are going to work with. Um, so x is orthogonal to y if, and we write with like x perp y if the inner product is zero. Um, this matches your notion of orthogonality. If you view things in R2, um, for example, if you have R2, you have a vector which is like 1, 1, and then another one which is like um, 1, negative 1. Um, this would be 1, or sorry, negative 1, 1. Then the inner product, you can see negative 1, 1, and then 1, 1 would be 0. And they're really orthogonal. Um, but this this works out in higher dimensions. That's how you can define orthogonality, basically. Um, 
so this notion of orthogonality extends to the linear subspace as I can say, for example, x is orthogonal to v, a linear subspace, and I write it as x perp v, um, if x is orthogonal to every v in the subspace, every vector in the subspace. So then the natural thing that I usually do is like, if you have xy plane, so think of the xy plane as subspace in R3, right? So this is our, um, so we have this subspace here. And then I have Z. So the vector, for example, 0, 0, 1. And then if this is V, so V is the XY plane. Um, then I can say that 0, 0, 1 is orthogonal to V. So this is going to be orthogonal to every vector in V because every vector in V has like non-zero coordinates here and zero here. This has zero here and non-zero here. You do the inner product, you get zero. It's a natural, but, but it's much, much more general. So you could have like oblique subspaces and vectors orthogonal to them. You can imagine rotating this. Um, and you get interesting settings. Okay. Yes. What's that notation symbol next? So you have x perp v, and then you have that. Oh, this. Yes. You talk about that. What is that? Anyone knows what that is? Okay. Say it loud. Yes. For all v belongs to the v. Okay, great. What was your name? UG. Oh, Y U V H. I usually, okay. For all V in V. Okay. I wrote it so that I remember. <laughs> I'm going to maybe like. Okay. For all V in V. Sounds good. There's like another notation that we're not going to use, but there exists V in V. These are usually used logical notation. For some V in V, this is for all V in V. Uh, not using here. So X is orthogonal to every V in V. Um, you can extend this no notation no notion to orthogonality of two subspaces. Two subspaces are orthogonal if every vector from one subspace is orthogonal to every other vector in the other subspace. So pick two vectors, one in this subspace, the other in the other one, they have to be orthogonal. So for example, you can say that um, this entire line, this is a subspace. If I call this uh, V2, then I can say that V is orthogonal to um, V2. And the way I define it is uh, that uh, for every x in v and every y in v2, we have x perp y. Or you can say for every x in v, x is perp v2. Another way of saying it. For every x in v, x has to be orthogonal to v2. These are our equivalents. Okay, so this gives us the notion of orthogonal complement. So the set of all vectors that are orthogonal to V, um, so this is slightly less general than what I'm going to talk about. Orthogonal complement is, so um, this V, let's say V is orthogonal to V2, but V2 might not be the set of all possible vectors that are orthogonal to V. So it might be bigger. The set of all vectors that are orthogonal to V might be bigger. So if you look at V, there's a natural subspace associated with it, which is called V perp, which is a set of all X's that are orthogonal to V. Okay, so that's, that's called the orthogonal complement. Um, another way of saying it is that it's a set of all X, such that inner product of X with Y is zero for all Y in V. Um, in the case that we have here, uh, if you have V, which is the XY plane, 
the orthogonal complement is really the V2, which is the Z axis. There's no other bigger subspace. I can't find a bigger subspace, which is completely orthogonal to V. So this V2 here would be V pair. This is the location or the set of all vectors that are orthogonal to V. So, um, if x, sorry, if v is x, y plane, then v perp is z axis. So if v is the z axis, what do you think v perp would be? If I take the z axis as v, what are the set of all vectors that are orthogonal to v? Great, yeah. So if you think about it, this is going to be x, y plane. So there is some sort of a duality. So if, if you have v and then you form v perp, if you take the perp of this, you get back v. So you can think of this operation as we have this in general. So if you have v goes to v perp and then goes to v perp perp, but this is going to be v. You're not going to get something v. So you're back in the original. So the set of all vectors that are orthogonal to my orthogonal complement is myself. So this is an example of a duality in linear algebra. So things that happen here, they're duals here. Uh, things that happen here, something dual happens there. So there, there are these pairs that are going together. So V and V perp are dual to each other. Sounds good. We know what orthogonal complement is, sort of. Um, questions? Okay, so if you know what this is, um, Yeah, so this is a little bit more interesting example, but this basically reduces to what I mentioned. So this X, for example, the image is going to be the XY plane, if you think about it, the image of X. And then when you try to go figure out the orthogonal complement, you can write down formally uh, what the orthogonal complement is. Uh, you pick a general vector, V, Z is going to be orthogonal to V, if, if and only if Z is orthogonal to the image. Um, for every vector in the image, but for it to be orthogonal to every vector in the image, it's enough to be orthogonal to just the x1 and x2. So if you have a basis for the image for a subspace, to be orthogonal to that subspace is equivalent to be orthogonal to every element in that basis. So to figure out the orthogonal complement, we can just um, pick a gen generic z in v and, and then try to force the, these conditions. z has to be orthogonal to x1, z has to be orthogonal to x2. Uh, not, not sorry, not z in v, but z, z in the, in this case, r3, because z in r3. Um, and then if you write down these equations, so a vector z that's orthogonal to x1, this gives you one equation. z orthogonal to x2 gives you another equation. And then you solve those, it forces z1 equal to z2 equal to zero. And then z3 is three, yes. So the equation that we get our prior equal to zero for each of the two vectors. Yes, yes, and yes. Yes, yes, yes. You pick a generic z. This is your variable. You 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 set these 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 two give you two equations. Each one is like inner product. This is a linear combination. Like some edge, so this would be like z one, like z one, z two, z three. Inner product with the first vector one one zero is zero. If you write it, this gives you a linear equation. The other one gives you another linear equation. So these are the conditions that have to be satisfied. So you solve the system. It forces z1 equal to z to the zero, and the z3 is free. So that would be just to set up the vectors that look like this, and it's just a span of this. And so this is just the z axis. It's like a formal way of proving it. Okay. Um, one more thing before we leave. Any questions? We come back to the orthogonal complement, but the inner product also. Uh, allows you to define a distance and um, basically size of a vector norm. 
So the Euclidean norm of X in Rn, sometimes called the L2 norm, is, is defined like this. So it's just the square root of the inner product of X with itself, or the square root of X transpose X. But when you write this, it's just the root of the sum of Xi squared. So you square the elements, you add them up, and you take the square root. That would be your norm. So for vectors X and Y, um, the norm of the difference is the Euclidean distance. So once you have a norm, which is derived in, in a product, you can define a distance, which is just the norm of the difference. So if you think about, um, I have a vector X, I have a vector Y, you can think of them as originating from zero. The, the end point is basically X and Y. So if you want, this is X, this is Y. Um, X minus Y would be um, this. Um, if I add y to it, I should get x. So this is x minus y. And so the norm of this, intuitively, how big it is, is just the distance between these two points, x and y. Um, and then there's this useful identity, x1 minus y squared is x. So this is like, um, if you have two numbers, a plus b is squared, you know this identity, a2 plus b2 minus 2ab. Um, for norms, you have this identity, you can get it by, um, by writing this as x minus y, and then x minus y, and expanding. So this, this behaves like um, what you expect, like inner product of x and x, inner product of x and y with a negative sign, minus y, x, and plus y, y. So you get expand this and simplify. You get the result. Yes? Yes, right. Yeah, but this is very nice way of like expanding that this this allows you to work with the, uh, the square root of these and the connection with unify. Okay, okay, so we're done. Next time we're gonna come back, talk about projection and some more advanced stuff, and then done with linear algebra. Thank you.